Hi students, um, this is Mrs. T. I'm here uh, with you today with a PowerPoint behind me, which won't happen very often, um, instead of being in my face-to-face -face class because I forgot my equipment today. When I went to school, I left it at home, so I couldn't um, record my face-to-face -face class session today. So here I am with you instead, just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, my cat is in the chair next to me, so he might come over and hop and try to get um, his time on YouTube also. So, so I hope he won't disturb us too much. But I want to cover with you today the same stuff that I covered in my face-to-face -face class. So you will be on the same exact schedule as they are. Okay, um, all your assignments and all of your topics and everything is all the same. And so you're going to see uh, the same lectures in the future. However, um, hopefully I will remember my stuff when I go to school and be able to uh, capture the face to face, the live action and get their comments and their questions that I can uh, repeat uh, loudly enough so that you can hear it and kind of um, understand the kind of thought processes that others are having a while we're covering this information. This video is the first of two that you will see during uh, week two of geography class. And if uh, you haven't already read my announcement about how our videos will work, you'll get two videos each week. And from those videos, you should choose your reaction paper topic. And after you've done your reaction paper, you should do a quiz. Um, you don't have to do every reaction paper and every quiz, um, like I told you early on. So review those, uh, review that syllabus and review those reaction paper rules if you're a little confused about why I said you don't have to do every single one. But pick a topic from today or Thursday's lecture um, or whatever day the second lecture is posted on and do your reaction paper that will prepare you for a quiz and also this information today about how to think like a geographer using those Mr. Help components that we um, talked about last week. Uh, this information is going to give you a lot of the foundation that you need to ace project one. So next week, um, I will be announcing when project one is going to be available and when it'll be due. So it's a hundred points. So you need to take really good notes on what we talk about today and ask me questions. If you have anything, um, you can text me while you're watching this and I will respond um, as soon as I see the question and, uh, Another option to ask a question is to post your ideas to the reaction paper discussion board that you can find in our YouTube class, not YouTube class, uh, Blackboard class, sorry. Um, so look for that reaction paper discussion board under the course content link, and you can post your questions there. I will answer them where uh, your classmates can also see the answer, and hopefully that'll also help people get ideas to um, ponder in their reaction papers. Okay, so let's get started. So you've already been looking at this um, information behind me about how to think like a geographer. I wanted to start here because in order to really use the Mr. Help concepts effectively, you have to kind of reprogram your brain just a little bit um, if you haven't ever had a geography class before. Most of my students have had a ton of history classes and are very familiar with the way historians think. Historians like to know um, three major questions uh, and kind of in this order, who did what, when, are the first three questions that typically come to a historian's mind. Why and where are also questions that a historian asks, but usually they come after the who did what, when. Um, usually the why and the where are mixed in there or left out in some cases. A geographer on their other hand is uh, the flip side. What we focus on first is the why of where. So the, per the particular location, the place or the region, these things are very, very important to geographers. So the where and why something happened where is uh, the most important thing that geographers focus on. Okay, so I have a few questions here just, you know, as examples for some of the kinds of questions that you can um, 
apply to the five themes of geography and some kind of ways to phrase questions that get to the why of where instead of the who did what when kind of questions that historians ask. Yes. <clears throat> so chronological information, like a timeline that historians are interested in, might be of interest to a geographer, but that's what would come later um, in geography kind of questions. So I have another example um, of a question that you could ponder here with why do cities develop around waterways initially? Okay, so um, that's the kind of way that we need to like reprogram our brains if you've never had a geography class before. Um, don't think uh, like a historian here, think like a geographer. Okay, so we have those five themes of geography. Mr. Help, as you can see down here on the bottom of the screen. Um, Mr. Help, uh, and on the next slide we'll talk about what those things are. Again, you should have them in your notes already. But um, these five themes of geography... Um, we're not technically, I should have corrected this, they're not technically created by the National Geographic Society. Geography is one of the um, disciplines, the academic fields that ancient Greeks pondered and asked questions about and did experiments and tried to calculate. So geography is an ancient uh, discipline, an ancient field. Um, however, it, recently in history, the National Geographic Society has... Uh, kind of separated, looked at the kinds of questions that geographers ask, and they calculated the five themes of geography that help us find out the questions uh, or the answers to the why of where. Okay, so here's a quick um, review of what Mr. Help stands for. You've already got this in your notes. If you don't, take a second right now to um, fill it out and let's move on and look at each of these things individually. Okay, I'm going to try to get down to this location um, topic down here uh, because that's about how far we got um, in my face-to-face -face class today. Okay, so before we start talking about movement, I am going to start with movement because I'm going to put these in order of Mr. Help to try to assist you in, in remembering them more easily. But I put them in this location, in this, um, pardon me, li listing, this order for this particular slide because this is really a more logical, really location is a part of place, is a part of region, is a part of the why of where movement happens and the why of where human interaction occurs the way that it does. So um, the order that your textbook author presents these themes in is really a logical order of basic to the most complex in uh, the thought process. We're going to reorder it to fit the order of those letters in Mr. Help. Okay, but the reason your textbook author has these listed this way, like I said, the logical order is the simplest to the um, most complex. Okay, so movement is our first um, is our first topic here because that's the M in Mr. Help, and so people and goods move, animals move, vegetation moves, uh, germs and bacteria move. You can't turn on um, the TV or the radio or even open up Facebook or Instagram without seeing posts of people talking about the coronavirus that's going on uh, that's uh, really causing problems problems, a terrible sickness and death um, in different places in China. There have been people quarantined. Here's a geography word that corresponds to movement. If you're trying to prevent the movement of people or things, or in this case, germs on people or in people, then a quarantine tries to confine you to a certain place. So movement is a vital part of human culture. People move, whether we are on foot or whether we're using any of these kinds of things like the cars and the trucks and the trains and the planes and space shuttles we have here. Um, I know that the Tesla company and also a company called Virgin Galactic and I think there's a third company in Japan. I don't remember the name of it right offhand, but there are many different companies, private companies, to, uh, who want to sell um, space vacations to people like you and me. 
So space shuttles, spacecraft, the International Space Station, sending men to the moon, all of these things have happened, um, have, you know, for decades before uh, you and I are talking right now. But as we speak, a lot of efforts are being made to further the movement potential of people and goods and animals and things um, into space. So people can buy a cruise ship trip to the Bahamas, for instance, and back. Uh, some companies want to sell us uh, trips to the moon and back, literally, into the stars, past the layers of our atmosphere into outer space. So movement happens of all types. Just this little part of movement that we're talking about is about people and goods. Information moves also. So um, you are looking at me on YouTube right now, maybe using your phone to do it. This is messages, information moving between uh, the two of us. Whenever you are playing multiplayer video games and you're chatting with people, they might be in Germany or South Korea or Japan or South Africa or any number of places who might be on the same server as you in the same um, group playing uh, these games together and communicating, interacting with each other. This is um, movement of ideas, movement of messages and communication between different places. Satellite signals um, are a big part of that, and so humans have to figure out a way to move. You can think of a satellite as a piece of equipment that has to be launched in order for messages to bounce from uh, one geographic location into space and then be sent down to another geographic location where uh, the message was intended to go. And so satellite signals are a big a part of... Um, of movement also and don't forget snail mail um, yes it still happens okay snail mail still happens okay so also ideas move so how do you explain um, features of fashion or religious stories or myths or messages in a movie a new hairstyle that somebody sees or memes that include messages from international locations, all of these kinds of modes of communication transmits ideas between people. So it doesn't have to come through um, formal uh, types of communication, such as a news program. It can come through simply um, communicating with family members who are in another state for instance. Uh, you can be signed up. I hope you are signed up for the rave alerts that we have um, at UAPTC. You can go onto the portal and enter your phone number so that you get messages pushed out to your cell phone if there's anything vital important like an emergency situation, a closure for any reason. We had a closure recently when um, there was a gas leak, I believe, is what it was, at, in a, one of the buildings on our campus. And so students got a message. Um, the idea moved from uh, the place that made the decision to the um, students who needed it before they t made the drive up to campus and then have to turn around again because our building was closed. That particular building was closed. So movement happens of all sorts um, in class today. We talked about, um, again, uh, disease vectors, part of the uh, reading assignment that you have in Chapter 1, talked about the cholera outbreak, and it, sh it described how movement of this disease occurred over time. So diseases can travel. Anything that you can think of that travels, the travel aspect is, um, is movement. Animals migrating during, um, during you know, the changing seasons those kinds of things also include movement. Okay, so regions are also part of our Mr. Help acronym. So regions have three different types of things that we need to classify, you know, that we can use to classify what a region is. So a region has locations and places in it, but it is larger than that typically. So 
Formal regions, the first of three types of regions, formal regions include things that we call geopolitical borders. Uh, these geopolitical borders are designated by some kind of controlling agency such as a government um, agency like I have listed here. Uh, formal regions have um, specific rules and different types of governance within them compared to other locations. Different sorts of cultural components that um, are affected or are um, prevalent in those kinds of areas. So formal regions are found on um, maps that show uh, boundaries between countries, boundaries between um, counties in a state and that kind of thing. When you see the weather map on a weather report about Arkansas, you can usually see the shape of Arkansas with the little um, shapes within it, which represent all the different counties that we have. So those are formal regions. Functional regions are defined by some sort of use or activity that goes on in the area. So for instance, formal regions are mandated by government. Sometimes they are mandated so that they become functional regions. For instance, trade agreements. Right now, the presidential administration is working on trade agreements with China, trade agreements with Mexico and Canada, different kinds of trade agreements, and you hear me saying these country names that are formal regions that are going to be consolidated, I guess is the right word, grouped together into a functional region where economic trade is possible under certain conditions um, based on those locations, based on the possibility of movement from one place to the next. So you hear me referring to movement, which we've just come from. Movement is um, something that can be related to and does overlap with all of the other themes of geography. Regions, as you can tell, is something related to and can be discussed and, and you know, ask more intense questions about the why of where when we overlap all of these five themes onto each other. Okay, there's also perceptual regions um, that exist. And these perceptual regions are more subjective. Um, so a formal region is objective. You can clearly see without a question where lines are on a map that separate, say, Arkansas from Oklahoma, from Texas, from Louisiana, etc. Those are clearly objective regions. They are formal regions. Perceptual regions, on the other hand, are subjective. That means they're in the eye of the beholder. And you can't necessarily come to agreement on exactly where a boundary of that particular region might be. So, for instance, um, a friend of mine is from... Um, Boston, Massachusetts, and I love her very much, and she refers to herself sometimes as a Yankee, and um, so sometimes I refer to her, too, as a Yankee, and we laugh about it, um, and once I asked her uh, where, you know, where does Yankee stop and Southerner begin, for instance, and she said, I don't know, what do you think? And we had this long conversation about where maybe, you know, how far to the south do you have to go from Boston before you get to a southern region or how far south still includes other people that you would call um, northerners. So these concepts are specific to an individual's perceptions of an area. So for instance, um, some examples here include uh, the Middle East or the South. If you ask somebody what constitutes the Middle East, what countries are considered the Middle East, you'll get many different um, 
many different uh, answers. Some people include um, all of the countries of North Africa because of a cultural belief and attitude, habits, um, religious uh, foundations that are in common in Northern African countries and countries al along the Eastern Mediterranean toward, um, toward the Gulf, the Persian Gulf. So, um, what constitutes the South, uh, the Southern states, like my friend and I were um, trying to debate. All of these things are subjective. In other words, they're in the eye of the beholder. Um, so formal regions are objective. You can clearly see them on a map. Perceptual regions are debatable, so to speak, and um, change over time, change from person to person, change much more readily than a formal region can change or than a functional region could change. So there's our mister in our mister help. Oh yes, and then this map um, came from an insider article that a uh, business insider article that I read recently. It was very interesting. Um, this author suggested that in the United States there were many different um, cultural regions. And so here is a picture of a map, clearly a map of the United States, parts of Mexico and Canada, where this author has overlaid on top of the formal regions He's overlaid his perceptual regions by color coding them and giving them different names like the left coast, the far west, midlands, etc. He has a uh, Yankeedom as an area here um, instead of the north. So anyway, this um, these are perceptual regions that this particular author discussed in um, an article recently in the Business Insider. The Deep South, Greater Appalachia, all of these different names that he applied to these are perceptual in his from his standpoint. And so he was suggesting to others that this is where he thinks these regions go and why he thinks they are distinct from each other and that kind of um, that kind of question. So the why of where was what that business insider article was all about. And uh, formal regions and perceptual regions mixed in. Now we come to the H E in Mr. Help, human environmental interaction. And so here to answer the why of where question, we ask things like how do humans and the environment interact with each other, affect each other? And the answers come, again, just like a region had three um, classifications for region, this time we're going to talk about three different classifications for human environmental interaction. First is dependence. Humans depend on the environment for a whole bunch of reasons. I have a picture of a barge here on, on a river. Transportation is one of the things that uh, people who all, all over the world in this globalized world of ours rely on rivers, oceans um, for transportation. And so I put a barge with some coal on it so that you can see that we are transporting Elements that have come from the environment, this coal is something that we have mined from the environment and we are transporting this. So we're interacting with our environment in multiple ways if we analyze this picture. We're transporting it and what is it that we're transporting? Goods that will help us run an electrical plant, for instance, if that's what they're going to use this for. So this has multiple facets, this picture. Even though we don't see any humans in it, we see the river system, we see coal, we see the barges that have been created to transport vital goods to another location where they can be converted into um, another aspect of human culture that will help us interact with our environment in yet a different way. For instance, the different way that we will interact with our environment once this coal gets to whatever kind of power plant it's going to is we will use that power to modify our environment. For instance, it is going to be cold this weekend. We're probably going to turn on our heat. 
we're probably going to turn on our electric blanket. That coal creating electricity or maybe a river creating power, these kinds of things are ways that we modify our environment in order to um, have better life experiences in order to make our culture, our habits, our preferences happen. We modify our environment when we plant food, when we uh, raise animals or harvest fish from a lake or river when we go and uh, fish there. So we modify our environment in a variety of ways. When you mow the grass or pull weeds or plant a rose bush or something like this for decoration, that's a modification of our environment. When you build a house on stilts, you are modifying the ground that you pour the concrete posts into or whatever your posts are made out of and you're building it up on stilts because you are adapting to your environment. If you live too close to a river or a flood zone, if you live down on the intercoastal waterway, in, uh, which is uh, a modification of our environment, canals built into the coastline for transportation purposes so that our culture can happen. So the houses on stilts, if you live close by um, to, to the coastline, you want to be up out of the flood uh, up out of the floodplain so that your house will still be standing after um, a hurricane, for instance, blows through. So humans do three things with their environment, three classifications of things. We depend on it, absolutely, because we have to get our food, our water, and the um, resources that we need for shelter from our environments. We modify our environment so that it gives us, for instance, predictable amounts of food, predictable amount of resources for shelter, and clean water to drink that won't um, cause infection or spread diseases. For instance, that's a modification of our environment that affects movement of diseases. And we also adapt to our environment. Uh, we know if uh, we live in a place like Arkansas that we have to adapt to the weather here, for instance, by having two kinds of clothes, summer clothes and winter clothes usually, and maybe something in between. Uh, perhaps uh, you adapt to your environment by putting summer clothes into storage when it's winter and getting them back out again and storing the others when summer comes back around. So you have adapted to your environment by having a little bit of storage space in your house, your apartment, wherever it is that you are, because you're going to have to store those coats or store those winter boots, for instance, um, in between seasons. So uh, we adapt to um, our environment. So human interaction with our environment is vital in order for populations to grow. If we simply relied on natural cycles of plants and animals, their natural reproductive cycles or migration patterns or the seasons of the year that plants normally grew and produced fruits and produced um, the uh, products that we needed to eat or to build our houses. If we only relied on natural cycles of these things, we would not be able to have large populations of people in the world. When we modify our environment to produce extra food, more food than under natural circumstances, a field or a region of, of a country could produce, then you are able to expand your population. Population is one of those topics that we are going to talk about. We have a whole chapter on it later on in the semester. But when we modify our environment to produce extra food, produce extra resources that we need for clothing and shelter, or to clean up a water system or dam a river so that we have a, a lake that was not originally there, it's man-made, and we clean up that water in order for it to be potable for us. Potable means drinkable and safe. 
then that's a modification of our environment that allows us to trick nature, so to speak, into letting our population grow much larger than nature would sustain if we didn't modify our environment. So food um, types, we adapt to the climate of a region and base the food that we try to produce there. We modify the region because if it is tree lined and we need, or tree covered and we need fields to plant things, then we're going to take trees down. Um, we're gonna remove rocks. We're going to plant things in tilled up soil and modify our environment so that we can do that. Um, we get something called deforestation, another topic that we're gonna look at later on in the semester, uh, when things like that happen too much. We get eras of history that you might have studied in your American history class, something called the Dust Bowl in um, the Midwest and during the Depression decades of the early 1900s, where people moved to what we now know of as the Corn Belt and got rid of all the grasslands that were there and got rid of the natural ground cover so that they could use the land as farmland and it had significant changes. It caused significant changes, very quick, short-term changes to the environment that people had to um, adapt to very quickly or, or die. Uh, the book, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, that you might have read in your high school or college careers um, describes a situation in which a family has to move. They have to engage in the movement part of geography because that human environment interaction with the Dust Bowl where they lived in Oklahoma, um, everything dried up, they couldn't make a living and they had to move to California to try to find another place where they could adapt to a new living style um, where there were jobs, where there was economy, uh, where there were different opportunities for them to, to live. So um, again, uh, Mr. Help, all of these things uh, we're talking about, you know, one by one, but all of them overlap and connect to each other. Okay. Location. This is the one where I stopped today while I was talking to your face-to-face -face counterparts in, um, in my face-to-face -face classroom. So we stopped with talking about location. For location, there's two different classifications of things. Absolute location and relative location. Let me go over relative location first, even though I've got it second on this slide here, because relative location is um, one of those subjective things like a perceptual region is subjective. Um, for instance, you might tell somebody, I live on Sycamore Street, and you can give them your absolute location, like this street address example that I have here. But you might say, well, I'm on Sycamore Street. And when you turn right onto Sycamore Street from Main Street, I am the third brick house on the left. It's something like the 12th house down the road on the left, but it's the third brick house. So only count the brick houses and that's mine. So there's a relative location. You're giving landmarks. You're talking about turning right or turning left. You're talking about how many brick houses there are compared to thing, houses that are made out of other ones. And that's how you'll find me. That's a relative location. So um, often we talk about that kind of thing. I, I'll meet you in the um, courtyard or I'll meet you in the cafeteria at lunchtime where will you be? I'll find a table close to the subway. You know, the, the subway counter. I'll find a, ta a table close to that. And that's how you'll know how to relatively find me when you go inside a building. Where is the biology lab? I think it's down the second hallway of the science lab building. So look down there. It'll be marked. There's a relative... Um, idea or a relative description of um, a location. Okay, so we use those, like I said, all the time. Okay, so um, absolute location, on the other hand, pinpoints 
specifically where we'll talk where we are talking about, such as the particular street address with the zip code and everything that I've got listed for you right here. Okay, so a particular street address gives no question. It's not 151, it's not 153. It doesn't matter whether it's a brick house or a log house or any kind of thing in between. It's 152 street number at in this town, this particular zip code. Or you can also measure things by what we call latitude and longitude. And so that's what this map address means. So let's look at that really quick. Now, I know you've heard about latitude and longitude before. It's a little bit more important than perhaps um, you have known about before because latitude and longitude has a lot to do with movement and human environment interaction and what region that you're in. It has a whole bunch of links to all of those things. And one link that it has um, with movement is something we didn't mention when we were on that movement slide, time moves. Time progresses forward, right? We can talk about the past, and that's a certain distance. We use the, the word distance in a spatial way, but we can also talk about distances in, um, in time. Time past a year, two, three years, these are distances of time. Like a light year is a distance, but we, you, you know, between here and um, the sun or something, however many light years it is. But time of day, the number of hours that we have in a day, the number of months on our calendar. Every four years is a leap year, so there's an extra day. It's an extra whole 24-hour period in the month of February, every four years. So latitude and longitude has a lot to do with that. It interacts with the rotation of the Earth and the wobbling that the Earth does on the axis. Um, it has a lot to do with um, interpreting time, not just interpreting where a position is on a map. Okay, so latitude and longitude are important. Let's start with latitude. So the equator is zero. It gets a zero mark, it's the zero point, and we count up 90 degrees north, we count down 90 degrees south, a negative 90 at the bottom, a positive 90 at the top, and with the equator at zero in the middle. So, equator, not, well, the equator is a latitude line. Latitude lines in general run from east to west, but they measure north to south. So if you see a degree symbol like 90 degrees north latitude, we are talking about the North Pole. If we're talking about 30 degrees north latitude, it will run through a particular continent at a particular place where we can pinpoint it using longitude also. So these north and south latitudes measure north and south, but they run from east to west. And so... If you are, if you navigate um, in uh, a boat very often or any kind of seafaring um, uh, experiences, uh, latitude and longitude is something that you know very, very well. Okay, so this is longitude. We have something called a prime meridian. The um, longitude lines are called meridians, whereas the latitude lines are just called latitudes. But the prime meridian runs through Greenwich, England. It runs from the North Pole to Greenwich, England. It does not go all the way around. The opposite side of the longitude um, is called something else. You know, the prime meridian, the opposite side of the prime meridian is called the international date line. Because these longitude lines are broken down, there are 24 longitude lines on the, the globe. Um, they are perceptual lines that we have defined in a formal way, so they identify formal regions that also correspond to the perception of time. There are 24 formal longitude regions on the map that correspond to the 24 hours of the day. If 
those people who had formulated uh, longitude lines had decided on 30 divisions, then it would be 30 hours in a day, for instance, um, or 12 hours in a day, or whatever um, whatever number they had arrived upon. So every 15 degrees of um, longitude, there is another official longitude line. And those lines run north and south, but they get west or east measurements. So if it's in the western hemisphere, which is west of the prime meridian, all the way back to the um, international date line, you get a W for the end of the, the uh, absolute location address. If it's at the prime meridian or anything east, all the way around to the international date line, you get an east marker on that absolute location address. Okay, so there's the North Pole. Um, so the international date line becomes the international date line at the point where the prime meridian um, intersects with the North Pole and then the international date line comes out the other side. These are perceptual um, markers on the Earth that indicate former formal regions that help us tell time and navigate and uh, you know organize movement and human inter interaction and that kind of thing. Okay, so the international date line and the prime meridian um, split the western and eastern hemispheres, just like the equator splits the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere. So these places are also formal, formal regions. Um, so the international date line, like I have referred to several times, um, separates, we call it the date line because it separates two calendar dates from the next. So uh, on one side of the international date line, it is, one, it is a day before, and on the next side of the international date line, it is the following day because we've hit that midnight point, and now all of a sudden we are the following day. So um, this international date line is kind of zigzaggy here, and this is kind of a light color on this map, but there are, it's zigzagging around land masses. So Russia and Alaska get really close together up here. And so in order for the international date line not to run straight through part of Russian territory, you are going to um, see this zigzag to include to allow for all these islands that go with Alaska to stay with Alaska and this peninsula that goes with Russia to stay with Russia. And then also down here in Oceania, you will see some hop skipping and jumping of the international date line away from that precise meridian line that is at 180 degrees. And so, yes, you get absolute location by combining these things. So when you are programming in an address from, uh, you, you know, where you're headed uh, and you at, it says you want to use your current location, your GPS on your phone is going to use these lat approximations of latitude and longitude for your particular location. Usually the GPS on the phone is about accurate enough accurate to um, put you within about two meters, um, two and a half yards of where you are actually standing at that moment. You can download other apps that will show you precisely what your latitude and longitude address is, um, where you're standing, where you're sitting right now. There's a variety of them. You can search the app store. Uh, but that GPS that some of us use, um, most of us use pretty often, gives us, uh, goes off this uh, latitude and longitude, but um, it only takes us within about two meters of accuracy of that location. Okay, 
So you probably have seen some of the maps that are spread out in the entire white area that's here and it, it stretches continents, it stretches land masses. This one is one of the better projections is what we call it. We're going to spend some time talking about maps and how to interpret maps here in just um, another couple of, of classes. But this particular map shows you how to apply these latitude and longitude lines um, specifically using the prime meridian and the equator in this case. So you can see where we get the north, south, east, and west lines. They come from the prime meridian and the equator. And so north, anything above the equator, south, anything below. And we can talk about the western hemisphere, which is anything to the west of the prime meridian, and the eastern hemisphere, anything to the east of the prime meridian. And yes, this is what controls our concept of time. Um, there are some cultures, however, that use other concepts of time. For instance, you might have heard of the Mayan calendar that uses, I believe, a lunar cycle. I might not um, have that correct. I, uh, and then also in countries that have Sharia law and m the Muslim faith as the predominant cultural anchor. Um, the year is not 2020. The year is 14 something. I would have to ask Siri what, what that date is. And you can do that now and find out those, those differences. And I believe it's based on a solar cycle, which is like this 24 hour day. But anyway, so these concepts have a little bit of a Western cultural bias to them. And if we go back to this map, you can see that this what we call the prime meridian prime means first runs straight through a place that we call Greenwich, England. And so the English are responsible for organizing this um, prime meridian precisely in the place where it is um, so that it's the center of um, this particular map projection. We'll talk about biases in maps a little bit later on also. Okay, so there's more to the Mr. Help acronym. We haven't talked about place yet, but this is the spot where I ended with my face-to-face -face classes, and so that's where I'm going to cut it off with you. So on Thursday, when I have another face-to-face -face class, I will do a little bit of a review of some of the stuff that we just talked about right now, and then pick up with place and move straight on in to actually looking at some of those biases that might exist in math. So thank you for your time with me today. Um, I do thank you, even though this is required. If we don't spend this time together, you won't do well in this class. And my goal is for you to do very well in this class. So please review these topics. Go back and fill in the gaps in your notes if you went through kind of quickly. And choose a reaction paper topic from either today or from Thursday to um, compose your next reaction paper from. Bye.